Hello, Jeffrey. How are you doing? Philip. Hi, you okay? Can you hear me? I can hear you well. Can you hear me okay? I can, and I can see you too. Wonderful. Have you had a nice, uh, nice week so far? I'm sorry? Have you had a nice week so far? Yeah, fine, fine. You're li just a little bit... My sound's a little bit blurred. You're probably not be too near the microphone, but... How, how, does that sound okay? Yeah, I think so. I think I'll catch most of what you're saying. Oh, there. Okay. But old and hard of hearing. Oh, that's all right. It, it will happen to you eventually. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, I'm sure it will. Uh, you had um, all, all, a lot of rain today. Hmm? You had a lot of rain where you are. Yeah, um, there's still something not quite right about the sound. Ah, I was, just gonna say, I was just going to ask what the weather was like where you are. Oh, wait a minute. Let me take the other, my earpiece out. Maybe that will okay. help. Try again. Uh, I just wondered what the weather was like where you are. The weather? Yeah. It, it's sort of season, seasonable temperatures. Um, what's that? 14, 15 degrees. Mid 50s. Oh, that's not bad. You're still on. Are you, are you on? Do you think in Fahrenheit or centigrade? Uh, centigrade, I think. Yeah, that's what you usually kind of work work in. Okay, so it's it's good. Yep. So how do we do this? You, do you have? Do you receive calls from people? Uh, I've got all. I've got lots of questions here. Uh, so some of mine and also some audience ones as well. Right. Um, so people that are online can ask us questions via the chat function. So people, people can write in questions and at a certain point when we're talking, I'll, I'll have a look at the questions and, uh, and okay. ask them. I'll do the best I can, give them, given my hearing isn't perfect. That's all right. Uh, if you yeah, just, 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 just say if you need me to, uh, to speak up or, or repeat anything. Okay, I will. I think we'll do, uh, we'll do just fine. Um, just wait for a couple more to join us and I think we can probably make a start. Um, yeah, it hasn't stopped raining where I am today. It's been, uh, been awful. Roads are flooded and uh, I didn't, I was driving home from visiting some, some relatives and I wasn't quite sure whether I was going to, uh, going to make it on time. It was uh, that bad. Yes, you did. That's all right. Mm. Just about made it. Next to my chat symbol, yeah. we've got the figure two. What does that mean? Just you and me? Uh, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's the uh, us two, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so what is it? It's just, just a few minutes gone. I'm just going to make sure I haven't got any emails. Sure got any emails to anybody that's saying they're having any problems. Uh, no, I think we're okay. So I think if we make a start, and then if anybody joins us later, they can uh, they can catch up. So that should be okay. fine. Um, so to say, I'm just going to start with saying. Um, uh, oh, hang on. Uh, Glenn says I tried to say hi by audio, but not sure if the mic works. Still, good luck with the session. Many thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so anybody that's watching along, uh, you won't be able to interact either video with video or audio. But if you want to ask. Uh, um, Jeffrey, any questions? Just pop them in the chat function, and I'll read the questions uh, to Jeffrey as, as we go along, so you can interact in, in the chat. Um, so I'll just start by uh, introducing the, the event. So, um, so welcome to everybody joining us for this evening's uh, in conversation event with Jeffrey Kane. Um, I'll just go through uh, some of Jeffrey's credits uh, for those that might not know. Um, so Jeffrey's credits include uh, TV series such as Dempsey and Makepeace, uh, The Chief. Um, then going into films, The Cold Room, Exodus, Gods and Kings, uh, GoldenEye, which was our main focus of, of this evening, and of course, The, uh, the Constant Gardener. Um, of all those credits, is there any credits that I've left out, Jeffrey, that you would have liked me to have mentioned? No, that's, that's the list. Good, good, the, lovely. The Chief and um, everything made this for television, of course, the others were film. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll kick off with my, my first question. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are wondering how, what made you want to become a writer in the first place and how did you uh, go about pursuing that, that career? 
Okay, that's an old question that um, I've been asked a lot. I think okay. all yeah. I probably are. Yeah. It's, it's something I've always known I wanted to do. Hmm. Um, I used to tell stories to my cousins when I was a kid. Um, yeah. I used to go and visit my, my older cousin. He was a year older than me. And we'd go into his bedroom and the lights were off. And I'd tell him ghost stories, but they were made up on the spot. I didn't know where they were going, but I learned structure later on. Yeah. It's never a good idea to start a story until you know where it's going. You've got to know mm. how it ends and roughly what the points are to take it there. Yeah. But that was, you know, it's not something I ever decided I wanted to do. I knew I always wanted to do it. What I had to make a decision about was at some point whether to try and do it professionally mm. or just do it as a hobby. I used yeah. to teach and I gave up teaching and I wrote some novels and then I got into uh, TV mm -hmm. and from there into film and it's a question of having um, a portfolio of, of scripts yeah. that producers get sent, they get shown around by your agent and if they like what you've done and they've got something they think you'd be right for, they they send for you and you have to convince them that you're the right guy for that job. Mm -hmm. So I got uh, involved in GoldenEye, but, um, Barbara Broccoli had um, come across something I'd done and she asked me to write a film for her about the, um, about the Navajo Indians and she liked that. And then there was no talk about Bond, although mm -hmm. she was doing Bond and very little else. And then she got into trouble with the script for Goldeneye because it wasn't going in the direction she was happy with. Mm -hmm. It needed a very substantial uh, rewrite. Yeah. And so she asked me if I would do it. Hmm. And that's where that began. That was my first uh, produced film. And did the film that you worked with with Barbara before Goldeneye, did, did that actually get, get made or...? Um... No, no, I did a... a two or three films before. One was a spec original, mm -hmm. uh, um, or the two, there were two spec originals. And then um, I was hired by a, a company in London to write a film for them, which they liked. And they asked me to do another, which they liked, and neither of them got made. Hmm. Well, that's the thing I need to mention to any aspiring screenwriters who are listening. Hmm. You get a percentage of your films, the films you write, only a, a small percentage of them generally gets made. Mm. I'm not sure what the average is, but it's something like one in eight if you're a professional. Mm -hmm. You expect seven of the scripts you've written to drop dead, and mm. if you're lucky, one will get produced. Yeah, and That's always been my um, proportion. I've written over a period of a good many years, 40, 41 film scripts five of them have been produced and I've got a story credit on one other but that's you know that's not far from being an, an average professional performance yeah so you have to be you have to be prepared for that oh yeah yeah certainly um did you find that this work that you didn't get made you then use the ideas of the plot in in novels and things so the work wasn't wasn't wasted um, not entirely. You, you've got to be careful because when you're hired to write something, whatever you write belongs to the producer who hired you. Mm, so yeah. you can't use too much of anything that you've already written for somebody else because they could legitimately have a claim on it. But yeah. you could take bits and pieces, small bits and pieces, the odd line that you liked from a, from a script you wrote that was never produced, you can stick it in somewhere else. Mm. So you started with, with novels and then made a transition to TV, um, TV script writing. Uh, did you find the transition difficult as a different, a different medium? Or well, it's, it's, it wasn't difficult, but there are di different, <clears throat> different rules apply. And television in those days, British television, different from the way it is now, you had a different format on the page. Mm. But it's always been the case with British television, not so much with American, that the um, producer is king. Now, mm. in modern American television, especially in cable, the guy who came up with the idea for the series is the boss, mm. who 
although he has to keep his network people happy, his creative decisions aren't interfered with by anybody other than the network. Whereas in film, the director is king. And once the producer hires a director, he takes over the creative work. And you can't, you can argue with him, but you can't really, you can never overrule it. Hmm. And he'll mess about with your scripts, not yeah. always in the way that pleases you. Hmm. You have to live with that. That's the hardest thing of all, I think. Yeah. All directors think they know more about screenwriting than the writer. Right. <laughs> Who call themselves writer directors? Mm. Uh, they're dreadful to work with, mm. and they'll put things in and they'll take things out, and they're all to what's there, and they won't have an eye to your overall vision. They'll right. just look at the bits and pieces, and sometimes the bits and pieces don't connect when mm. they finish with your script in the way that you saw them connecting to begin with. Yeah, and that's a, that's a hard lump to swallow. Mm. Because the the Cold Room uh, film that was based on one of your novels, I I believe. Well, I don't I don't even count that as a film credit because that was written by the director, mm. and I had nothing to do with the filming. I just took a bit of money from from them for the right to do it. So I can't really comment on it except to say that it was okay. I think it, it, I, I wasn't I wasn't writing films then. But in hindsight, would you have, would you have liked to have been able to have, write the, have written the screenplay given... Yeah, now here's the thing. <clears throat> it's an axiom in, in the film industry that novelists should never adapt their own work for the screen. Hmm. It's a very sound principle. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it happens very successfully. But on, on the whole, it's better if you've written a book to sell it to a producer or a studio and then sit back and hope that you'll like the, the result. Yeah. And, you know, because it's, it's out of your hands and, and so it should be because it's a different medium. I was very lucky with John le Carre because he was delighted with the, with the film that was made from his novel. Mm. And if you've got a DVD of it, you should see his, um, the interview with him at the beginning with the, among the extras is an interview with le Carre. And he says that he didn't recognize a single line of dialogue. He didn't recognize most of the scenes, but he's mm. delighted with the result. It's not the film of the book, he says, it's the film of the film, mm. but it says all the things he wanted to say. And he's very, he was very happy with it and thought it the most successful film made of his work. He liked the television, original television version of um, Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy. But of mm. the films, I think he liked The Spy Who Came In From The Cold but he didn't like much else except the, um, except the constant gardener. Hmm. That's good to hear. That's that's the best praise you can get. Oh yes, yes. Um, I can I just add that I wrote a <clears throat> I wrote a script. <clears throat> excuse me, a few years ago based on um on a book, um, and I did some things with it hmm. that the producers weren't happy with because they felt it went too far from. The story as it was told in the book. I got a lovely letter from the original uh, novelist who said that he noticed he hadn't seen the film because it wasn't made, but he saw the script. Mm. That there were some 20 points in the script where I'd made a decision and he recognized that he'd had to make a decision and 19 of the 20 had gone the way he'd gone. In other uh -huh. words, approved of what I'd done, even if it was different from what was in the book. Mm. And that was a great letter. Yeah, because when you're adapting work, do you have to be, are you quite sympathetic to what is on the, say, written in the novel? Do you try and be careful or do you feel more... You have to read the spirit of the book. Yeah. Whatever the book is saying, the film needs to say. Hmm. But how you do it is a question of taste. It's, yeah. like a, it's like a duet. The novelist is singing, you're singing, and the two should harmonise. Hmm. Or look at it another way, if you want a different analogy, it's like the analogy of parents producing a child. The mother and the father produce a child that is neither one of them, but looks a bit like both of them and yes. has characteristics in it of them both. Hmm. So that's how I see film writing. Hmm. So when you came to, to GoldenEye, I think it was 94 that you came in on GoldenEye, um, 
what was the state of the, the script? Because Michael France had written a, a version of it. Um, yeah, I got a phone call out of the blue on Thursday afternoon. And I was living in Rosson Y. And a phone call from California, Barbara Broccoli. Hmm. I knew because they'd done a film for her, which she never got made because she was too preoccupied with the Bond franchise. Um, can you, when, can you, how soon can you get here? She said, hmm. um, MGM's got so many million dollars waiting to spend on this film. And we haven't made a film with them for six years. Hmm. We're going to start the franchise up again and we can't do it with this script. Right. So I said, well, you know, it's like Thursday afternoon, Barbara. I'm not going to be able to get there before, I mean, Saturday. <laughs> Fine, she said. We'll, we'll, we'll book you a flight on Saturday. Mm -hmm. I got there and had a meeting with her on the Sunday, and then we started going through the problems on the Monday. Mm -hmm. I said to her, um, how, long will I, how long will you need me for? I said, because I don't like to be away from home and my wife too long. Mm. She said, if if we're not finished in three weeks, we'll send for her. Yes. Three weeks went past, and on the Friday afternoon of the third week, I said, Barbara, do you remember something you promised me three weeks ago? And she said, she's in the air. <laughs> and, and how did you find out Michael Wilson? Did you have much to do with Michael? Michael Wilson, I found a bit problematic. Right. Maybe he's come along since. Mm. But at the time when this was being done, he hadn't a lot of experience and he didn't really understand film structure and yeah. he didn't really understand bond structure. He started off with, he, he treated it like a mystery story. Mm. People were being killed all over, over Europe. Scientists were being murdered and Bond was called in to find out who was doing it and why. And that was like the beginning of a, an Hercule Poirot story. It was mm. more Agatha Christie than Ian Fleming. Yeah. I had to explain how Bond films work. Um, Michael Francis script had no, very few, if any, of the normal Bond tropes in it. It didn't mm. have, it didn't have Q. It didn't have um, Bond on, uh, in his suave mode. Um, it didn't have any violence. No, very, it had some, but none to speak of. There was mm. even one scene where he's fighting in a cave with a nuclear scientist and the nuclear scientist gets the better of him and runs away. I said, come on, you know, that doesn't happen to James Bond. Mm. If somebody who isn't a professional fights with Bond, the guy's on the floor in two seconds. Mm. So that sort of thing, it was a lot of work to do and that, you know the result. So how long did you have to turn it around? Because um, obviously they had the start date and Long as it took, they were they were just dead in the water, mm. and Barbara knew better than to rush me. So yeah. we spent three weeks talking about it in Los Angeles, and then I came back and we had some meetings in London, London, and then how long it took to actually finish the script after that I can't remember, but it was well within the parameters of a normal a normal uh, adaptation, which are maybe two months. Mm. The studios always give you three months for a draft, which is very generous because you don't have yeah. to rush. You can take a day off or yeah. two. Yeah. But um, normally I'd say about two months, you yeah. know. Mm. So they weren't unhappy with that. And then MGM coughed up and so it went. But mm. what happens in filmmaking often is that for no reason you can figure out, they replace you with another writer. Mm. which is how Bruce Fisting came into this. Yeah. Barbara phoned me one day, a couple of weeks or a week after they'd received my script, my first draft, mm. and said, we love it, we love it, MGM loves it, everybody loves it. And then there was a pause and I said, yeah, don't tell me, but I'm fired. Well, yeah. <laughs> we brought Bruce in, we brought him in to write a few jokes. I said, well, you know, I do jokes. I'm actually quite a funny guy. If you'd asked me for jokes, more jokes, I'd have given them to you. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know what went on there. All I know is that they paid me off and Bruce Fierstein took over and some of the elements of the film were his, mm. but most of it's mine. Right. So, because um, you, uh, yeah, it must be quite disappointing to be a place like that because you would have liked to have had another crack at the, the script. Um, do you remember specifically the stuff that Bruce had changed from, from your... From yeah, your... I do. 
Um, he put in the, the, the CIA guy, oh, yeah. Joseph Baker. Mm -hmm. um, he changed M into Judy Dench. Yeah. And, you know, those are things I could have done if it said, you know, what we'd like is, is M to be a woman and mm -hmm. we'd like a CIA guy. I'd have done that, but they didn't ask. They just got mm -hmm. Bruce to do it. But most of the rest of it is mine. Actually, I made a mistake on that. Print, it was a royal performance and we all had to stand in a line and the Prince of Wales went along the line talking to each of us. And I'm standing next to Michael France and mm. uh, His Highness said, um, oh, so you're the writer, you, you, you wrote the story for this. And like an idiot, I said, well, not exactly, Your Highness. Before I could get another word out of what I was going to say was I adapted and altered an already existing script and made a lot of changes to it. Immediately turned to Michael France and said, well, you're the writer of it, you invent the story. Mm -hmm. And I got no more to say. I'd oh, know better yeah. next time. Mm -hmm. So the premiere might have been, must have been quite something to, to, sit, to, to, do, to attend a world premiere. It must have been quite a, a, a member experience. It, it, it was what they call a glittering occasion. Mm. Yeah, we had the um, the reception afterwards in the one of the museums, the military museum. What's it called? The Imperial War Museum. Oh yes, yes. So they, they held the uh, the reception, but the mm. Empire Leicester Square, Odeon Leicester Square, I think, was the venue for the for the for the premiere screening. Mm. And as always with royal premieres, either the Queen or sometimes it would be the Duke of Edinburgh. In this case, it was the Prince of Wales. Mm ends in her place. Um, you mentioned my, Michael France. He sadly passed away, um, I think, at the age of 59, far, yeah, far too young. Um, do you have any, um, yeah, yeah, a great talent. Do you have any um, me memories of, 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 of Michael, what he was like? Did you? He was never happy that he'd got um, only a story by credit. Do you know how the credit system works? Uh, no, could you... Uh, could you the audience that? might like to know how that works. Hmm. When a film is completed, when a, uh, the film is completed, it's been shot, the um, producers of the film, whether it's an independent producer or a studio, has to send to the Writers Guild of America what they call tentative writing credits. Mm. They put up the names of, name or names of the people they think needed to get, need to get credit on the screen. And if one of the writers objects to that, feels that he's been left out or he's got the wrong credit, then you object. And as a process, mm. uh, well, what happens in that process is that you have to send them, first of all, they send you a copy of the final shooting script. Mm. So you can check everything against that. Yeah. And they send you a copy of all the scripts written by all the writers who were on the project. Mm -hmm. I went through one of these things recently with um, a film that's coming out next month called The House of Butchie, um, oh, yeah. Ridley Scott. Mm. Um, so I objected to the credits because I wasn't included. And then you include a statement with, um, you send them a statement saying why you think you should have had credit on the film. Mm -hmm. They sit on this issue for about three weeks as a, a board of three, all professional screenwriters and then they return their decision and their decision was final hmm. and they decided in the case of Goldeneye that Michael France deserved story credit because a lot of the story was based on his ideas but he didn't merit screenplay credit which they just they gave to me and, and Bruce Hurston. Right. And Michael was very unhappy about that never I don't think ever recovered from it I don't mm. think that's what killed him, but I mean, they, until he died, he was bitter about that. And I'm bitter about the butchy thing, too. Yeah. Because you have to accept that the process is the process and you're glad it exists. But if you don't agree with it, then you're, you're robbed of several things. When you lose credit on a film, when your name's not on the screen, you don't get your um, production bonus. Mm. You don't get residuals which is money is paid periodically for earnings. And it's one less credit, you know, on your CV. Mm. It matters to us whether we get a credit or not. 
yeah. they have, they judge it by percentages. They have to decide um, what are the percentage. It's, if it's another writer involved, well, if it's one other writer involved, you have to have done thirty three percent of the script. How you mm. judge that? It's not about how many pages it is. They make a judgment on what you've done with character and what you've done with with plot and what you've done with dialogue. And sometimes their decisions are very strange. People do question them, but that's the system. And you have to just live with it. Because I think there was another writer that worked on Golden. I think it was a gentleman called Kevin Wade. Yes, Kevin Wade was was involved, but didn't get any kind of credit. I don't no, no. even know, I don't even know what Kevin Wade did because no. I know what I did, and I know what Michael France had done, but I never saw um, uh, anything that purported to be Michael uh, to be purported to be Kevin Wade's draft. I didn't even see Bruce Fierstein's draft. I saw the yeah. final script, which incorporated mm -hmm. the material from Kevin and mm -hmm. from Bruce. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of um, your vision of, of the film versus the final product, how kind of different is it um, from what you had in mind to, to what we actually see now um, in the finished film? How is the finished film different from my script? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, here we come back. Here we come back to the bogeyman, yes. the director. Yeah. It's always yeah. the bogeyman. <laughs> and Martin Campbell, hmm. I didn't see much of him. See, during the during the shoot on Golden Eye, my wife was seriously ill, and I couldn't go over him to the set and, right. and see what was going on. But what happened there was I had a scene. And I've talked about this before in another blog. Mm. Um, I had I'd written a scene which I thought was quintessentially James Bond. And it was changed for something that I thought was quite frivolous and pointless. Mm. You want me to tell you what the scene was and what it became? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah please do. It's where Bond goes to see Valentin, mm. uh, his, his old enemy, Rob, Robbie Coltrane. Um, and it starts when he, he goes to the entrance of the place where Coltrane hangs out, Valentin. Valentin opens the door, Bond sticks a gun in his face. And immediately a gun appears in bon, at the back of Bond's head. Mm. He's already anticipated this. Yeah. You cut to a scene where the two of them, Valentin and Bond, are sitting at a card table, small baize covered card table, there's a pack of cards in the middle of it. Mm. and a Valter PPK. And Valentin says, Bond, we're going to play Russian roulette. And Bond says, excuse me, Valentin, but one plays Russian roulette with a revolver. You know, yeah. it's, 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 it's click, click, mm. click, bang with a revolver. With an automatic, it's bang straight out of the box. So mm -hmm. it's really up to who fires first. Yeah. And he says, yes, very true, Bond. Here's the cards. We cut the cards. Whoever draws lowest card or highest card fires the gun first. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's a bit of a dilemma. And the audience is going to wonder how he's going to get out of that. Hmm. So they cut cards and Valentin wins the draw. So you get thinking, well, what's he going to do? Is he going to shoot Valentin? Hmm. And then how does he get out if he does? Because there's all Valentin's blokes in there. Hmm. And he picks up the gun and he puts it to his head and he pulls the trigger. And it's nothing. It's click. Mm. And Valentin laughs, a hearty Russian laugh, and says, Oh, Bond, you're the only man I know who can tell the difference between fully loaded Beretta and uh, Walter BPK, whatever it was, and one with no bullets in, just mm. by the weight. Yeah. <laughs> he's judged the weight and he's figured out, yeah, okay. Now I've seen that scene actually happen in, in 24. 24 has taken a couple of things from, from this film. They mm. took that, I don't know where they got that from, but I, did, I wrote that scene first. Yeah. And it happens to um, um, Jack in uh, 24, the same thing with the empty yeah. gun. Yeah, it does, yeah. And um, there's something else that uh, 24 has done. Oh yeah, they, they've, they fired off an EMP in one, yeah. of, them, one yeah. of the episodes. Well, you know, we got to the EMP before anybody. This yeah. was 1994. In, the internet wasn't even around. It was just, just beginning. Nobody knew even what the, I'd never heard of it. No, no. 
so we had to get um we had to get a, a, a actually it was a hacker they hired a hacker to talk me through what boris is doing by making the uh, origin of his transmissions um concealed you know the jumps he does from place to place to place yeah. so he talked me through that but it was brand new stuff and the mm. emp was brand new too mm. so it seems a bit dated because it was all new stuff i mean I, well as you say the emp idea has been used in a number of um you didn't you've never seen it before 1994 mm. 95 yeah when the film came out mm. so i think we were we were first with that yeah it, I remember. it's used to some good purpose here because the whole point of this the plot is mm. about stealing money yeah and making all the records disappear yeah uh, when you uh are writing characters for um for, for the page did you have particular actors in mind or and, and how do you feel about the cast in, in the well film? that brings up the question of who james bond was going to be and we didn't actually know who james bond was going to be i'll tell you that in a moment yeah but in general terms um a lot of screenwriters and novelists and i'm one of them likes to have an actor in mind even though you know he's never going to do the part it can even mm. be a dead actor you just yeah. want to in your head there's got to be a face and a voice to say the lines you've written you know you might think of humphrey bogart doing something or you might think of a contemporary actor but maybe you'll like get him maybe you won't mm. but it's useful to have a face and a voice that you can put the lines to mm. as for the um for the casting of bond that this was a tricky moment there'd be no no bond films for six years mm. and the last bond had been um tim dalton yeah tim, tim had decided he didn't want to do anymore mm. so they were looking for a new james bond and pierce brosnan had been interested in doing the part some years before that but was tied up contractually on um what was that series tv series he did uh, remington steel yeah remington steel he was tied up on that and wasn't free so they had to go with with tim mm -hmm. anyway now he was free of that contract and he was the first name they had in mind but barbara wasn't convinced that pierce could do the job properly she mm -hmm. was okay with him doing the um i'm not sure whether it was the swarf bit or the tough guy bit, but one of those two she wasn't certain about. Perhaps right. it was a humour. Maybe she thought he didn't have the the means of of getting across that wry humour that Bond has. Anyway, um, there was a there was a meeting meetings with him, and and she also had a group of young hopefuls, young young actors, good looking, well built young actors who desperate to do it because once you're james bond you, your career's made mm. you know money profile all the things actors want they're there once you've done james bond mm. so we were having lunch in um in hollywood and she was based in santa monica which is about i don't know 10 miles away or something mm. and if you go along the streets it takes forever you have to really go by motor by uh, the freeway to get there in any reasonable time and we were having lunch with a possible director who didn't actually it wasn't martin campbell and she suddenly looked at her watch and said oh my god i've got i've got 10 young actors waiting to be inter to be auditioned and and they, that was supposed to start five minutes ago and it's mm. going to be an hour to get to santa monica mm. now what to santa monica surely not well like 20 minutes well, I couldn't do it in 20 minutes. Can you do it? Yeah, of course, you take the you take the um, uh, the, the freeway the 10 and then the, uh, whatever the other freeway was. Well, I don't drive on the freeways, said Barbara. They scare me. I said, well, I'll drive. So we got into her car, which was a, a Volvo 750 Turbo. And I drove like the clappers and there's one part where one freeway joins another but but the join is so close to where you actually get on it you get on it and you get off it less than a quarter of a mile later and it's four lanes and it's busy time of day 
you've got to cross all four lanes to get to, to the turn off and then take it. And I did that and she's like this, <laughs> covering her eyes. And when we got to uh, Santa Monica, 20 minutes later, she was a wreck. And I said to her, did I pass? You passed everything. That was why we're here now. <laughs> now did I pass the test? What test? What test? The James Bond driving test, Barbara. You're looking for a James Bond. I was just doing the drive. Well, you drive great, but you're too old and you wear glasses and no. <laughs> <laughs> And then we had all these young hopefuls mm. trusting their stuff, but yeah. her mind was getting closer and closer to Pierce Brosnan. Mm. So we took Brosnan to lunch, and about halfway through, um, he excused himself. We assumed he was going to, to the loo. Mm. But he went into the, we were in the Four Seasons. He went from the dining room into the lounge where my late wife was waiting and he saw her there, he, he know, knew her from being introduced to her. They went and sat next to her and she said to me afterwards, I was there for 15 minutes and no waiter or waitress came anywhere near. Pierce Brosnan comes and sits next to me and there are four waitresses hovering around at the same time. So at least I got lunch out of it, she said. Hmm. So, so when you were writing the script originally, as you say, there was no Bond cast. So did you have to write the character of Bond in a fairly neutral way? And then did you tailor it to Pierce as it went along? Yeah, I wrote it with, with, with Sean Connery in mind. I had Sean Connery in my head. Yeah. And, you know, I just wrote lines that I could hear him saying. It didn't matter who said them, but that was how mm. I did that. Yeah. Speaking of Sean Connery, can't be broccoli. Um, didn't have much to do with producing that film. He'd yeah. retired, but he was still there as a presence and a consultant. And he said to me, do you know how I chose Sean Connery for, for the first James Bond? He'd come to be auditioned. And we talked and he had the right credentials and all that, but I wasn't certain. And this was Pinewood Studios and the window overlooked the car park, the window of his office. And when he left the office, I stood at the window and I watched him cross the car park. And he, I'm sure he didn't know he was being watched. Mm. It was just a window. He didn't know I was, that was the window of the office he'd been in. And when he walked towards his car, there was something about his movements that reminded me of a cat. Huh. And that was the moment when I decided he was going to be James Bond. Mm. The rest, as they say, is history. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because I've heard that Barbara Broccoli saw Daniel, uh, when she fought Daniel Craig for Bond, she saw Elizabeth and the way he was, his mannerisms and his, and his, and his walk. And I think a lot of Bond is the physical. That lazy way he speaks, hmm. you know, that Edinburgh accent. Yeah. And the lazy way he speaks, it made him so perfect. Yeah. Everybody's been trying to get there since. And I don't think Daniel Craig's got it. I, I think, yeah, I, I think each Bond brings something different to to the role, and and certainly Daniel's done done that. Um, but uh, so, so your favourite would, would be would be Connery. Oh, Connery's number one, and and Pierce is number two. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I I grew up with with, with Pierce's film, so I, I agree. Which one did you see? You saw the first. The, which one did you see first? Uh, the first one in the cinema was was Goldeneye. And I was uh, uh, 11 years old at the time, uh, but I'd seen a few on, on, on VHS before, so I was kind of familiar with, with all the Bonds, um, but Pierce was, was my, you know, the Bonds. The first thing Barbara did when she hired me was to give me, well, they were videotapes then, mm, yeah. videos of all the Bond films to date, it's all 16 of them, this was mm. Bond 17. So I watched, and although I'd seen many of them, I watched them all the way through, all of them. I got a very strong sense of who James Bond was and what, what the film needed. Mm. So I put back in all the things, that, I put in all the things that Michael France had left out. Mm. The stuff with Q. Um, that's a terrible moment in, in that scene with Q, mm. where Martin Campbell made a dreadful mess of it. Mm. Do you remember Bond goes into the workshop 
and there's a, an exploding dummy in there and all sorts of stuff. And he spoke, what's supposed to happen is the, the line's delivered, but it's poorly delivered and delivered at the wrong moment. Hmm. So Q was explaining about the pen and how many times you have to click it to turn it on and click it to turn it off. And then there's the watch with the super strong steel wire in the, in the, in the, um, in the case thing. Mm -hmm. And when he's done that, and they've had their little bit of badinage, Bond is supposed to reach out and pick up the sandwich, uh, the baguette that's yeah. on the table. Mm. And what's supposed to happen is that Q is supposed to go, don't touch that! And you think, oh my God, it's a bomb. Yeah. My lunch. Yeah. But he doesn't do it that way. He just mm. very casually says, oh, don't touch that. It's my lunch. Mm. Yeah. The whole, the joke falls absolutely flat. Poorly directed, poorly performed. And that's an example of how you write something that mm. has guts yeah. and directors completely screw it up. Mm. Yeah, I think that moment for me has always been, as you say, not one of my my favourites. So I, I I noticed that that as well. You did. Um, yeah, uh, it's supposed to be an urgent cry, as mm. though as though Bond is, is picking up or just about to pick up something really deadly. Yeah, and drops it immediately, mm. and then the, the 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 line is, "That's my lunch." Yeah, and it's funny and it's tense and it's neither of those things in the film. Mm. I mean, was there a scene or a particular line in the film that the way it was delivered or directed surpassed your expectations and, and, and you got something out of it that you thought, oh, I didn't even see that? Or, or thought, You're looking for something that the, the, the director enhanced or the actors enhanced? Uh, it, it either, yeah. Not really. I, I don't think I, I don't think so. Hmm. That's running my mind back over it. Yeah. No, it's it's mostly negatives, I'm afraid, the directors. Uh, now, Fernando Moraes, on the other hand, enhances a script. This is what you want from a director and from actors. Mm. You write a script and suddenly you're seeing things on the screen that you didn't think were there because yeah. they're not specifically called for. Moraes mm. does this wonderful shot from um, from the golf course just pans across to the slum town of Kibera to show how close they are and the contrast. And while he's doing that, he tilts up to a plane mm. flying across. And that plane then lands in wet London in a different, in a different color palette. It's a marvelous mm. little sequence. Just yeah. a little brilliant director touch. Mm. But then he's a terrific director. Yeah. The only thing he did that I didn't like was to stick in a scene that I hadn't written. That's a horrible thing. <laughs> but we're talking about GoldenEye, so you don't want to hear about that. Um, well, well, anything you want to, want to share, I'm sure the fans would like to. No, it's just that scene in the bath mm. with uh, Ray Fiennes and Rachel Rice, you know, mm. Ray, pretending to be Jacques Cousteau, exploring, oh, embarrassingly bad. And I had nothing to do with that scene, but the rest yeah. of the film he's done beautifully. Mm. So, um, so what would be maybe your two or three top favourite things from from Goldeneye? Either you know the scenes or the, the lines. Well, obviously the stunts are great, mm. um, except I find the motorcycle off the cliff to mm. the plane a little bit. It stretches plausibility too much, but yeah. I love to jump off the dam. Mm. And what and see what happened with Michael Wilson again? Sorry, Michael, but this is you know, he starts with a notion of what stunts he wants in the film, yeah, and expects you to construct a story around the stunts. And I said, Sorry, that's not how I work, that's not how any screenwriter works. You mm -hmm. start with the story and the characters, and then you illustrate it along the way with some good, exciting stuff, including some very good stunts. You don't start the process of thinking about the film with, oh, we have to have a stunt of this, we have to have that. He knew what stunts he wanted and where he wanted to shoot them. Mm. Not, now, that's not to say that the opening stunt where Bond dives off the dam is a bad one. It's a great start, a very exciting and tense scene. And, you know, 
comes in through the loo. I think he actually had a different line in the script from the one he utters. Yeah. But, you know, the, the stunt's good. Mm. But the one off the cliff is a bit of a stretch. But all the rest of it, the, the, the tank is my favourite stuff. I mm. love the tank. Yeah. And that's exactly the way I, the way I wrote it. Mm. He jumps in this tank and turns the turret and goes straight through the nearest wall. Yeah. To escape. That's, that's wonderful. And that yeah. was filmed exactly as written. Uh, how about the um, statue on top of the tank? Is that your idea? Yeah, or... well, no, that was, I think that was a director. I think think that was a directorial touch. I'm not, I can't remember whether yeah. I wrote wrote that or not. Yeah, but it's a nice touch. It's fun. Uh, and Pierce's lovely thing with the tie. Is it? Yes, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's probably Pierce. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I wrote for him to do that, but he just decides on the spot to trade his tie. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you, did you find it challenging writing for big action sequences like that, or? Not really, no. It's 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 actually quite boring because you know that the the description on the page is nothing like um, the the scene when you see it on the screen. Mm. Um, it's not challenging you to do your best work. It's more or less pedestrian routine stuff. Yeah, you know, you, a lot of writers describe a fight scene, for example, in very simple, straightforward. He punches Smith. Smith um, falls to the ground but picks himself up, counter punches Jones. Mm. It's dull. Yeah. You know that the choreography of that fight will be decided in the end by the director and the fight choreographer. Mm. It doesn't actually matter very much what you say, but think of the script. When you when it leaves your hand, it goes to people who have to make decisions. It goes to money. Mm -hmm. It goes to maybe a studio executive. It goes to actors. And the script has to read well. It has to be a page turner to stand a chance of getting made. So you mm -hmm. need to put your best efforts into describing everything, including the action scenes. So that mm -hmm. when they're reading, it's like reading a, a good action novel. You know? You can't say they fight for 50 seconds, Bond wins. Mm. That doesn't give you, the reader, any sense of what's going on. Mm. And there are, there are a fight at the end on the um, um, antenna, uh, Arecibo, yeah. and the, the dish. That's a very good fight. And that mm. was choreographed very precisely. And I wrote the description very precisely too. Mm. And I thought that worked well. He did that, he did that very well. Mm. I mean, Martin did it very well. Yeah, yeah. And the actors did it very well. Mm. So yeah, um, pluses and minuses. Yeah, I think that, that fight at the end is particularly very, it's very reminiscent of uh, From Russia With Love. And it's, um, did you have that in mind when you did it, that it was? Uh, did uh, um, the, the, the fight uh, uh, with Bond and Trevelyan in the antenna room, it's very indicative of from Rush with Love. Did certain Bond films inspire you when it was certain scenes? And subliminally, probably. Mm. You know, I was aware of all the great scenes and all the great Bond movies of the past. And that the fight on the train in the from Rush with Love is what I was back in my mind. I wasn't consciously trying mm. to uh, reproduce it. That's I mean, one of yeah. I mean, do you have it as, uh, as a fan, but also perhaps as a, as a writer? a favourite Bond film, and maybe because of, as a fan, and then maybe as, as a writer? Well, I guess, I guess so. Um, From Much With Love is certainly one of them. Mm. And Goldeneye, oh, sorry, Goldfinger. God, yeah. Mm. Um, there are bits in others that I love, but I think the two films, that, the two Bond films that satisfy me most, I think, are those two. Mm. But that's to do, again, with when, when they were made and when I first saw them. Mm. 62, I think, was Dr. No. It was, yeah. Or was, Gold, uh, was Goldfinger. Mm. Um, 64, I was just off to university in 64. Mm. Um, so, you know, that the good age to be coming across James Bond. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Critical, but young enough to be mm. interested in the, the excitement of it. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, how do you feel as, as a writer, the films have developed since GoldenEye, particularly maybe with... with it's, gone in, it's, it's gone in phases. And before GoldenEye, it had gone silly. Hmm. And I'm, I said this the first time I had this conference with, with Barbara Broccoli. Hmm. I said I thought that Bond needed to be totally revamped. The, um, the Tim Dalton stuff was fine, but very short on wit. Hmm. And before that, he had had all the um, um, what's his name? The, the, the suave one. The, the guy. Um, Roger Moore? Roger Moore. Yeah. Roger Moore never convinced me. Hmm. I mean, he's tall and reasonably well built, but he just doesn't have a tough look about him. And he's fighting with a seven foot giant on the edge of a cliff, and it's just laughable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, plus, the fact that the seven foot giant falls out of an aeroplane and picks himself up and starts all over again, that also is a it had a cartoonish quality. Yeah. And I remember trying to, no, I didn't have to work hard at it because she was halfway sold on it, but telling her that it needed to come back into the world, into the real world a bit more. It's never going to be the real world of MI6. Yeah. That's not how MI6 works. There is no such character. And at least let's pretend that it's real world, whereas the Jaws guy was never in the real world. And he was, uh, Roger Moore was too soft. Hmm. But um, there's a line I love from one of the Timmy Dalton films. They're not my favorite Bond films by any means, but I do love the, the line in one of them where the president of the uh, South American country says something a little bit um, out of line to the chief villain, who says, remember, Mr. President, you are only president for life. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a great line. It is, yeah. yeah. Um, to go back to the Golden Eye, Golden Eye cast, did, did you, was people like um, Funker Jensen and uh, Sean Bean very much kind of oh this is this is how well, I Sean Bean was very much on the on on the um, on the nose for that he he was the right guy. Um, yeah. Joe Don Baker as the as the CIA agent is okay too. I like Joe Don Baker. Yeah, he's ex he's been excellent in in several films. You see him in Cape Fear. Uh, oh, a long Scorsese. time ago. Yeah, the Scorsese version of Cape Fear. Hmm. Tough private detective, hmm. and um, he's taken out by uh, Robert De Niro. Oh yeah, he yeah. Liked him very much in that, and he, he was he made a good CIA agent. I don't have a problem with um, Elizabeth uh, Skorupko, mm -hmm. who's lovely, yeah, in flesh as well, mm -hmm. and Famke Janssen. So yeah, the Bond girls were good, and and all the accessory cars. Mm. It was well, it was well cast. Yeah, I think particularly Robbie Coltrane as Valentine was. Well, Robbie Coltrane as Valentine, yeah. 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 Um, I, I did have, the uh, the character of Trevelyan is obviously scarred because the uh, uh, the Yanis character is is hurt in the explosion in the beginning of the film. Was his scarring more? Of a thing in the script because in the film it's very sort of on the side, it's not really obstructed face, it's very PG 13 sort of thing. W would you have liked it to be? No, that? it's described described in general terms. I don't remember what the what the kind of wording was, but hmm. that's up to the makeup people and the director to decide the specifics of that. Hmm. It's not a it's not a totally precise instrument, a, a film script, because hmm. It's going to be messed about with by so many people and interpreted by so many. The makeup people make up their minds about the makeup. The mm. stunt people decide how the stunts to be carried up. The director will have input, but in the end, they decide what's viable, what's safe, and uh, work out how it's to be done. Mm. Um, and all the departments um, work in that way on a given script's blueprint. Mm. But uh, it needs to be a convincing blueprint or else you don't get the um, elements that you need to make the movie. You don't get the money. You don't find the top actors. Mm -hmm. They need the part. They can get the teeth into it. And production designers, you know, people who have a, a good reputation in their own field, 
mm. won't work on something they consider an inferior product. So mm. use all of those people to please, and then the money. Yeah. Those who finance the film have to like the. They have to read it as a as a read and say, yeah, I like that. I'd I'd want to see that film, and you're there. Mm. And if it's lackluster, they won't say that. Mm. So that's how you need to do it. I was a novelist before I was a screenwriter, and I bring, I bring some of the novelist's equipment to writing uh, scene description, for example. Mm. Yeah. It's not just bare bones, simple short sentences. They read like Hemingway, some of He gets up, he crosses the room, he sits down, she comes in the door, she sits down. He picks up the glass, he puts down the glass, he drinks. It's, that's telegraph ease for me. I can't write like that. I don't want mm. to. Yeah. But all the screenplays, if you've ever read a screenplay, I've often read that way. Mm. So I write in whole sentences and sometimes complex sentences. Yeah. Because you have to save space. You mm. can't have a screenplay that runs over 200 pages unless no. you're writing a five hour movie. Mm. So you want to condense the screen description, but you want to make it readable. So it reads like a little little section out of a novel. Yeah. Because um, GoldenEye had quite, quite a, a sizable budget for, for its time. It was 57, yeah, it 57 million dollars it, it came in at. Um, did, was there anything, though, that, that you wrote that was, you thought, oh, maybe this has been cut for, for budget or? No, you have that, you have that commonly in, independent productions this mm. is a studio production and yeah. it's a high profile movie um ridley scott said to me once write it as you would want to see it if you can put it on the page i can put it on the screen mm. don't worry about budget don't worry about money and normally you're thinking well you know i can't have three burning helicopters in this scene because it would take up the entire budget of the film mm. You write whatever you want mm. in a big budget Hollywood movie. And that's the, the lovely part about it. That's the freedom it gives you. Mm. So, so in some cases you're writing with an idea of, of, of the money, what can be done, what, what can't yeah, if be you done. Have a, if you're on the limit, I always ask the producer before I take on a project, roughly what kind of budget um, he or she is thinking of. Roughly, ballpark figure. Yeah. And if it's under 20 million, you know, you've got your work cut out because you've mm. got to make make a viable screenplay out of it mm. and not have people hung up on on the expense of a particular scene, especially this important scene. They'll drop things anyway. Mm. So but with 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 a Bond movie, you don't have those restrictions. Yeah. If you can conceive it, you think it would make a good scene, you write it the way you think it would go, and it goes that way, as long mm. as the director agrees. Yeah. And he's there for it. Because mm. there was, uh, I don't know if you recall, The World's Not Enough, and there's um, some helicopters that chase Bond with some score blades that, that uh, are underneath the, the, the helicopters. And that was originally in the script for Goldeneye. I don't know if you recall. The helicopters with the rotating blade that was, well, that was something that you yeah that's right i remember that yeah do, do you know what the decision was kind of to, to remove that from the uh screen no, i don't it may have they may have found it not practicable do, do you recall uh, I think that that's something that michael france written that, that was michael francis yeah and, uh, if it wasn't viable to make it practical to do they'd have cut it but i remember that i remember reading about it in france's script i'm pretty yeah. sure I think I might have kept it in mind. It never got yeah. to the screen. Yeah, because it seemed because there's so much in Golden Eye, so perhaps that extra sequence was just one too many. And yeah, and you know, I've cut things. I've seen things cut out of films before that were huge. We had a whole section in Constant Gardener hmm. that they actually filmed in Canada. Remember when Justin Ray finds goes investigating the circumstance of his wife's death he goes to germany he goes to london and then he goes to germany and there was a section where he went to canada to do further investigation an expensive sequence they flew a unit to camera to canada mm -hmm. and they filmed it 
and they brought the film in at about two hours and 20 minutes. And then it was a joint decision, we all agreed to it. The way to trim the film, to make it pacier, was mm. to take out the Canadian section. And having spent the money doing it, they dumped it. Yeah. And that was the right decision. Because mm. I, I suppose it, having a scenes in the script is one thing, but when a film is edited together, it takes on a life of itself. Yeah. You never know how it's going to look when it's filmed. Sometimes mm. the filming of a scene can make something out of it that wasn't on the page, makes it better. And mm. sometimes it looks great on the page, which doesn't work when you're yeah. in the film. And those decisions are made all the time along during the production process. Mm. I've had a question come in from one of our, our viewers. Uh, we've, we've partly touched on it, but you may... Made... We have 14 now, I think. Uh, yeah, we've got some good, good, uh, good numbers. Um, I had a question: uh, Did any character end up being quite different in the finished film to how you imagined them? So, was there any dramatic differences from your concept to maybe what Michael? Or Martin... Sorry, what what ended up being different? Uh, in any particular characters that Harry were does. dramatic uh, or character traits, perhaps? Um, no, the characters were pretty much on the screen hmm. as they were in the script. <laughs> Except, you know, I had the scene with Valentin doing, doing the uh, Russian roulette with an, with an automatic pistol, mm. which is a fun concept because few people use revolvers now in, in thrillers. Mm. It's almost all nine millimeter automatics. And you can't play Russian roulette with a clock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really... Well, Humour in it as well as tension. And mm. for all those reasons, I thought it was... Very quintessential Bond. Yeah. But no, there are no characters. Um, no characters change during the writing, or mm. from the writing to the filming, to my knowledge. Mm. Huh. So, so when you saw the, the the finished film for the first time, did you feel that okay, wow, this is this is this is a good film? Did, did, were you happy with the final the final results? You know, I'm trying, to, trying to send my mind back. 26 nearly came out it came out at the end of 95 yeah and now we're near the end of 21 yeah. 26 years hmm. it's hard to remember exactly what my reaction was yeah. to seeing that hmm. 26 years ago i don't think i was dissatisfied i can't remember whether it was well wonderful hmm. or just yeah okay <laughs> He's done a good job of that, that's all right. And did, did Goldmine have any impact on your career, either, either positive or, or negative? Was, was it? Well, I argued with Michael Wilson a lot during the um, development of the script. Mm. Some quite heated arguments. Yeah. Um, but then I always do with directors. Mm. And they generally tend not to employ me again. They want somebody who will give them an easier ride. Hmm. And therefore, I wasn't asked to do any more Bond movies. But um, did it have an effect? Well, it was, it was my first produced credit. So I'd gone from being a screenwriter with some good scripts to show around to one who actually had a film made. And that makes a big difference. Yeah. Your first film is really important if you're, a, if you're a professional screenwriter. You've got something you can point at and say, I'm, I wrote that, and there it is. You can go see it. Yeah. And after that, I got an Irish film called Inside I'm Dancing, which was made. Um, and the third credit, I think, was it's Constant Gardner. Hmm. And that made a big difference. Yeah. Because there was a a lot of publicity attached to it, and I got an Oscar nomination for it. Mm. But GoldenEye, as uh, in itself, it didn't make a vast difference. Um, I remember going when I was researching Inside I'm Dancing, which is about a couple of seriously disabled guys, significantly mm. disabled, I think is the term I'm obliged to use. And I went to see somebody who had very, very bad cerebral palsy. Mm. Um, he typed with a, a 
a bit of pencil, a, a stylus in his mouth, you know. Mm. Could, could hardly speak. And he used to write his messages on the, on the screen. Mm. And I was taken to see him and introduced. And the person introducing me said, well, this is Jeffrey Payne, who, who'd written one of the James Bond films. Mm. Which one? Golden Eye. Mm. Who based? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, um, you said that, Jeffrey, that makes you feel good. Yeah, uh, you said Jeffrey that in preparation for tonight you rewatched Golden Eye. I did. I watched it last week. I hadn't seen it for literally years, mm. um, and I thought some of it felt a bit dated. Mm. But it certainly moves along. It's well paced, mm. and there's some scenes that are memorable. They they still stand up with tank stuff, for example. Yeah, the fight on on the um, Arecibo and dish, mm. wonderful. There's still stuff there, I like. Mm. I, I think all the business with, with, with the pen as well is is very tense. Yeah, he doesn't do that terribly well. No, um, it's supposed to look casual, but it looks as if he knows what he's doing. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes, as we as we said before. It's, it's the, the direction and how it's edited that oh, stuff it's, it's actually the direction <clears throat> and it's it's good to see bond keeping count of trying to keep count of the movements mm. i mean he'll tap it twice and bond's waiting for the third one that disarms it yeah. he does it again that, that's that's a, a, again a, a scene designed to create tension mm. do you think it works yeah yeah. Okay. So I think Goldeneye was a, a a very very important film, as we said, six years between Licence to Kill and Goldeneye. It's hugely important to the franchise because yeah. they matter they quarrelled. Um, Dan Jack, who makes the film, Barbara's company and Michael Wilson's, had quarrelled over something. There'd been a lawsuit, and it'd gone on for about six years, mm. and no Bond films were made during those years. Yeah. And then they decided, all right, they'll make one. Hmm. And they agreed on the, um, uh, the theme. And Michael France was hired. And the money was up in the air because the studio was weak, as it's been for ever since. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, and Barbara looked at the script and said, we're not going to do it with this. It's not hmm. going to work because it's absolutely the wrong concept. Mm. And then she looked around for someone to do a major rewrite and lighted on me. And very glad that she did. So yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not anything but proud of it. I'm, oh, happy, yeah. I'm, I'm very proud of it. Yeah. I'm happy with it. Yeah, I think we're all very glad that you, you did do it because it is one of the best bombs ever, ever done and it reignited the franchise. So, um, it came at an interesting time historically mm. because before um, uh, Putin, the, uh, the, the former Soviet Union was still in very much in flux. Mm. Uh, the oppressive Soviet government had gone, nothing had yet replaced it. It was full of gangsters, gangster millionaires, uh, and a, a wild west of a place. Mm. So, and all of that fed into Bond's former enmity with the, the Soviet Union and enemies like Valentin. And it was a good, a good time to be doing the Bond movie. Mm. And the bad guys were Russians, mm. but they weren't the old Soviet Russians. They were this new generation like Boris, mm. Putin-wise, mm. using um, high tech to commit their crimes. So Bond is low tech. Mm. The enemy is high tech. I like the armored train. I stole that from Dr. Zhivago. Oh, right. Mm. I wanted an armored train. I remember the scene in Dr. Zhivago when he gets aboard the armored train. Mm. I, mean, I, I had a, quite a, a fun little question come in. Uh, did you... Um, Ever ever see much of the the video game Golden Eye that they? they do I see what, uh, they, no, I don't. I haven't seen it. Yeah, 
Um, are you aware of, of how fans regard it? Because it is amongst Bond fans and, and gamers one of the best games that was ever made. And I think that's part What I'm aware of, Philip, is that I didn't see a penny in profits from that game because that was it wasn't included in my contract. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah, well, that's a shame. Yes, um, it is a shame. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, because it's a really good, good game, and partly, obviously, because of your wonderful writing. Um, so, I've just, if we just go to some audience questions, let's uh, see what we've, we've got. A second. Uh, sorry, bear with me. Um, you know, I have a, an audience with a grand total of sixteen. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, we're doing we're doing well. Uh, uh, some of these you've already kind of, kind of covered a, li a little bit. Um, this is a good one. Is writing novels more fulfilling because there's a higher chance of the novels actually reaching public consumption unlike screenplays? So you know that people are going to, going to read your work. Are they more satisfying because of, because of that? Can you boil that down to me? Because I didn't catch anything oh, you said. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, is, is, is writing novels more fulfilling than... More fulfilling than writing screenplays. Yeah, yeah. In some ways, yes, in some ways, no. The thing about a novel is that if you're writing a novel, you can afford to be sloppy. I remember pointing this out to John Le Carre. He wanted to do something. He came to the meet a lot of the meetings. Mm. And he wanted to, um, this is for Gardner, he wanted to do something at the beginning. And I said, do you realize that that's three pages of script and three minutes of running time to do mm. something that you don't actually need to do? Yeah. You don't have the space in a screenplay. And the comparison I usually make is that a novel is like an epic in prose. Mm. And an epic can be a thousand lines long or a thousand pages long. There's no length. War and Peace, um, Gone with the Wind, they're all huge, huge novels. Or you can succinctly write a novel in 250 pages. With a film, it's got to be between 90 minutes and 120 normally. Mm. Yeah, it, it sometimes spills over a little into 125, and there's some wonderful healing comedies that come in at 80 minutes or 85, but that's your, those are your parameters. And in order to get a story into that compass, you've got to be really economical. Mm. So screenplays are all about economy, and therefore it's, it's a fascinating discipline. Whereas with, with a, a novel, you can afford to be more expansive, more discursive. Mm. That gives you more pleasure and gives you more room to write interesting prose and be poetic if you want to. So they are different and they, they appeal to you in different ways. Mm. And how did you feel writing for TV? Because it's, it's quite intimate in terms of budget and, and stories you can tell, but you can also... Yeah, low budget and you've got to get your story into, well, what was it then? ITV, 50 minutes. Mm. BBC was about 55 or 56. Yeah. So it's again the same thing. It's, it's the discipline of getting a story into that compass. When you, when you see it done brilliantly well, it's so good. Mm. There have been old TV episodes that I'm aware of that did miracles in, in 40 minutes. Mm. So much so that you, you know, you felt yourself wishing you could have done that. Mm. And doubting that you might you would have been able to do it as concisely and as interestingly. Yeah. But it's the same thing. Mm. Uh, in terms of uh, um, genres, drama, comedy, is, is there more one or the other that you prefer to write or you would have liked to write more? I like to think of myself as versatile. Mm. Um, which is why it was annoying when Barbara said, oh, we, we, we've got Bruce Fierce in him because we needed some jokes. Mm. And my first reaction was, Barbara, you know me pretty well. You know I can be funny. Mm. Nobody asked me for more jokes. I could have written more jokes. Mm. Um, but, you know, I'm good at that. Mm. Um, and I'll, I'll have a go at almost anything. I'll write you a, a comedy musical Western set in space if you want. Mm -hmm. 
yeah and, and and i guess as a writer you like a challenge you like Excite, the exciting writing for me is is is, uh, is witty writing yeah i like to try and have witty conversation in, on the screen and mm. on the page mm. but almost anything will do fine i'm doing something at the moment of course for a, a whole different set of skills mm. um, i can't say what it is i haven't even signed the contract yet but it's pretty surely going to be mine so that's what i'm working on Oh, so that sounds I'm flexible and not mm -hmm. restricted to any particular. But if you look at my credits, you'll see that. Yeah. They're yes. not contained within a given genre. Mm. It, I mean, it, it's, it, I mean, would you prefer to, do you prefer to write uh, entirely from scratch your story, your screenplay versus the adaptions you, you've done? Is it more difficult? Yeah, that, that's a tougher job, creating a story and telling it from beginning to end for the screen with all the requisite beats in all the right places. More satisfying, I suppose, to do that. Mm. On the other hand, adaptation is its own art form. To find those things which are essential in somebody else's work and then put them into screen terms so that they're, accept, uh, they're intelligible, accessible, um, and always interesting, creating the right pace. Mm. They're both they're both different skills. The um, the awards people always, when they're doing the screenplay awards, have the best adaptation award just before the best original, which comes last. And therefore, that's giving it pride of place. It's considered to be the mm. the, the peak of. Uh, of the screenplay achievement to write a, a first class original script. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, I just haven't been lucky enough to get an original script to the screen. I've written three or four. Mm. But adaptations, well, they come to you. You don't go to them. Mm. A producer comes to you, an agent comes to you. We bought this book. Will you adapt it for us? Mm -hmm. And it gives you the bare bones of the story. It gives you some characters that you can work on. Mm. And You've got to put these things together in the right order. It's not just a question of taking the scenes out of the book and putting them on the screen. Mm. There's a lot more to it than that. Yeah. So um, there's tons you need to leave out. Mm. Things that don't work, that, that, are, that are getting in the way of the straight, clear, clean line that you need to find. Mm. What William Goldman called the spine of the story. Mm. Um, he was very good at this job. I mean, when it comes to a TV series like The, the, the Chief, uh, you're looking at 30, 30 plus episodes and obviously more chance to develop characters and um, a bit more, a bit more like, like a novel, I, I guess, more of a journey than you get in a... That, and if I found Goldeneye a bit old fashioned, The Chief, mm. oh, no, it would, I'd do it very differently now. Right. It has that very worn up old fashioned feel. A lot of it because place procedures have changed over the years, mm. but um, so has television. Yeah, mm. it's one of the things that could be right for a reimagining, it, sound, it sounds mm. like. Uh, I had another question come in. Um, uh, what at present is your most fulfilling writing project and why? Which of my projects has been the most thrilling? Uh, uh, yes, the one you most most enjoyed, and and why that is. I suppose I'd have to say Gardner, hmm. um, because it was a tough adaptation. The book was it was lengthy, hmm. and it wasn't constructed primarily as a thriller. When when John le Carre wanted to write something that kept you guessing, mm. he knew how to do it. What he did with Constant Gardner, he deliberately gave away the story early mm. on. Yeah. But he had two Scotland Yard detectives coming out to Kenya to investigate. And they report their findings like a quarter of the way through the book. Mm. And it tells you everything you need to know. There are no, there are no mysteries left. And you can't do that in a film. So I had to reconstruct it in order to keep the resolution, um, the reveal, until mm. 
close to the end. And I did that by chucking those two Scotland Yard detectives out of the film. Hmm. I've had one come in at a later stage and announce, you know, that it was announced that he was going to be doing the investigation on behalf of Britain. But you don't see him after that, just one very brief scene. But hmm. you can't have these detectives reporting their findings. It's hmm. just too nice to find the answers to the questions. That's hmm. what he's all about. That's his function in the film. Yeah. But it was, um, therefore, it was a challenging um, job. And I was very happy to really end up with a script that people liked hmm. and only my name on it. Yeah. Because Simon Channing Williams said to me at the beginning, as long as you keep producing drafts that I'm happy with, I won't replace you. Hmm. And he never did. Kept his word. Okay. It was his last film. Yeah. Um, uh, you were Academy Award nominated for the, the Constant Gardener. Um, I wanted to know what your opinion is on, on things like uh, awards and how important or not that kind of recognition is for a writer. You can say they're un unimportant if you've won three or four of them. I'm sure Woody Allen would tell you they don't matter. Mm. You've won mm. several. But if you're waiting to win the first one, they are important. Now, yeah. what they actually represent, I'm not sure, um, uh, because you're talking about getting a majority vote from something like 7,000 Academy members. Mm. What is important is getting the nomination. Yeah. Because the nomination comes only from your branch of the Academy. Mm. But when, when, when the, um, the writer nominations are, are voted in, they come from something like four or 500 writer members. So you're being voted in by your peers. That counts. Then the, the thousands of actors and directors and uh, cinematographers and film editors and sound editors who vote on the, in the final vote, hmm. their, their vote accounts for a bit less because you don't necessarily, they don't necessarily have the expertise to judge. And I'm in the same position when I'm voting for cinematographers. I don't know enough about their art to be able to say with absolute certainty that one is better than another or makeup or costume. Hmm. So, yeah, they're important for other reasons, too. Um, there are only a few accolades that ever count for the general public. Hmm. There's things like an Olympic gold medal. Yeah. Um, and um, a Nobel Prize. Mm. An Oscar is like that. It may not require exactly the same degree of ability to win a, a screenwriting Oscar as it does to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, but mm. it counts in, in the popular court, and that's why you want one. Mm. Yeah. They have hidden the fact that I'd love to have one and um, it's theoretically still possible. Yeah, so, oh. yeah that, would be, that would be great. I came close and I think one of the things that I, that I slightly uh, disappointed at is that the subject matter of Brokeback Mountain was fashionable. Yes. Mm. And a lot of Oscar, uh, the, the Oscar of voting was driven by uh, political correctness and fashion. Yeah. It is what it is. It's California. Yeah. What can you say? Yeah. Well, I think they always there's... they do things differently there. Yeah. Um, I think there's always been lots of jokes about if you wanted to win the Academy Award, there's certain types of films actors should do or writers should should write, and the the joke of well, if you want to win the Academy Award write a film about the Holocaust or something dramatic like that, something... Every, any given year, mm. you can look at the Academy Awards and all the categories and find at least one that mm. you think, what? <laughs> hey? <laughs> mm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I always find it a, a, a bit odd because even if you have five films that are fantastic, how do you pick the best? It's like saying, is an apple better or is an orange better or is a... a it's hard it's... To, sometimes it's hard to do. Sometimes it's mm. hard to do because there are so few good mm. movies, good films. There, I can't remember the last time I saw a movie 
and and in the um, best picture category that mm. I thought was worthy of a best picture. Yeah. What you do is you vote for the one that's the least bad. <laughs> yes. Really. I think you're right there. Yeah. Think of the great films of the past mm. that have won Academy Awards for best picture. Mm. It's not making them that way anymore. They don't have the same quality. Yeah. Much better stuff coming out of cable television. Yeah. So, so you think that the, 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 the best opportunities are perhaps in, in, in TV and perhaps film is becoming a bit generic. You have big films like the Marvel and... It, no, I'm not the only one who thinks that. Yeah, yeah. Gold, Goldman again pointed this out in Adventures in the Screen Trade, the, yeah. the decline in in uh, standards mm. um, for Oscar nominated films over mm. the decades. Yeah, it's not happened, and it's still happening. Yeah. So you feel you're attached to a a dying art form. If you want to call it an art form. Yeah. Now, the best place to be if you're a young writer with talent is in America writing serious stuff mm. for cable, pay cable TV. Right, yeah. If you're lucky, you're on really good shows. You know, mm. some wonderful shows. Mm. You uh, still dream of the possibility of writing a really good film that becomes a very popular film and, and a critically acclaimed film, and it happens once in a blue moon. Yeah. A film which is critically acclaimed and money making yeah. and generally judged to be brilliant. I, mm. I can't remember the last time it happened. Yeah. It happened. Gandhi was such a film. Yeah. Uh, I mean, have you been surprised that the Golden Eye has, has stayed with you all these years? That it's something that people are, are still interested in talking to you about? Is, is, is well, that... These are, these are uh, uh, hardcore Bond fans, are they not? Mm. Yes. Um, you know, if you if you've formed an attachment to Bond pictures over the years, mm. then we all go on loving them even after they've stopped making them. Mm. And Barbara Broccoli and uh, Michael Wilson seem determined to go on making them as long as they can find finance for them. So yeah. success breeds success. Mm. People are putting up the money because they think, well, you know, we've had twenty four or twenty five of them. Why shouldn't we have twenty six? It's the rule wow. in Hollywood is. Carry on till you fail. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's and it's, thing. And it's, Keep going it's, until you fail. Yeah. Don't stop just before you fail. <laughs> just go that extra inch. Yeah. Which is why you have series going on longer than they should. Yeah. And they're repeating themselves. You see plots being repeated. The same yeah. moments. Being, you think, oh, God, not again. We saw that in season two. They're doing it again now in season nine. Yeah. They don't know when to stop. Even Finnegan knew when, when to stop with um, Breaking Bad. Yeah. Although the prequel to Breaking Bad is different stuff. Mm. He knew when to stop. That story was told and done. And mm. I'm sure they must have been they must have been trying to get him to do another season, and I'm sure he refused. Mm. But remember, admiration for that man. Mm. I, I, I think you're, you're quite right that... Um, it is, all, it is a movie business and business being the important word and it must be quite frustrating as a writer to see a movie that's not very good but it gets a sequel because it was financially successful so uh, an artist purity versus the, the business side of it all. Most of the people in Hollywood who have a li make a living making movies and I mean not the creative people so much certainly the producers and executives of the studio would be just as happy producing carpets. It would be a gigantic carpet warehouse. It would make no difference to them at all. Mm. It's what carpets are selling, which ones look likely to be selling next season, mm. what are people asking for? Do they want predominantly birth colours or do they want vibrant pinks? It wouldn't make any difference. They'd just go to work the same day in their Mercedes and, and, and talk carpet instead of talking movies. And that never used to be the case in the way, way back when I was a boy. That is a change. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I started writing screenplays just at about the time when that change occurred, a big change. Mm. Yeah. Because I was hooked on the, the movies of the, of the 50s and the 60s. 
Mm. And there were some still some good ones being made in the 70s, fewer in the 80s, fewer again in the 90s. Every mm. year, I look at the uh, the films that are coming out each year, and, and I have to judge which ones I think are worthy of a Best Picture nomination. And they recently raised the limit. It used to be you had to choose five, and then they gave you up to ten or nine. I couldn't oh. find nine. I could hardly find five. <laughs> you're lucky to find two you know mm. but we're worthy of being a best picture yeah so it means best picture from that awful year you know, so, doing, you're not doing Amadeus anymore or Gandhi yeah. or uh, out of Africa yeah oh, not Africa. doing the apartment and they're not doing so many of those wonderful movies and my favorite year for movies was 1946 mm. you had um it's a wonderful life yeah. and you also had the best years of our lives mm. films like that you know nobody's making those anymore no they don't. i mean if you were if you were a young writer starting out now would would you want to stay clear of tv and film or rather than shooting myself what would i do it, well if yeah if you were starting over and you were a young man entering the industry would you stay clear of film and, and tv no i think I'd, I'd probably want to be involved with tv more but yeah. it would have to be top quality tv mm. and there's more of that being done in america than there is here we do make excellent series we make series like uh, line of duty yeah mm -hmm. But um, there are very few, and they're usually writer-driven. Mm. Um, in America, you get a, a big series for cable or network, and they have a writer's room. The show mm. is run by the showrunner, the guy who thought up the idea. Mm. He usually writes the first and the last episode of each season. But they have a writer's room where they meet and agree upon... Um, principles of character, plot, and so on. Mm. And the people in the writer's room write individual episodes, which are then vetted by the showrunner. Mm. That's the way to get your name on something of quality. Yeah. Um, and then you go from that to coming up with a show format of your own and getting to be the showrunner of that, mm. which I think is the route that people like um, Kurt Sutter followed. Uh, he was involved in series like Oz mm. and then went on to be showrunner for Sons of Anarchy, which mm. is a magnificent show, in my opinion. Yeah. Mm. Have you ever written for uh, the, the theatre, Jeffrey? And if not, would you like to? Sorry, have, you ever, have you ever written for the, the theatre? Have I written for the theatre? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, yeah. And if not, would you like to? No. I, again, the theatre is one of those things, it's like the tale of the gardener. Mm. The gardener is um, the American tourist mm. uh, who has been on a tour of one of the great British uh, um, country houses. And the lawns are perfect. The grass is of a uniform length and uniformly green. Mm. And she says to them, she sees the gardener working in the garden. Oh my God! How do you get your garden so beautiful? And he says, Madam, you begin 600 years ago. Mm. That's the answer to that question. Yeah. What was the question? Oh, uh, would you like to have, have, have written for, for the stage, for theatre? Yeah. Mm. Working for the theatre is something you need to begin 50, 60 years ago to do. Yeah. Because there are so few plays being put on and mm. so many good established playwrights competing for that space. Mm. And it's all really, I won't say it's impossible, but it's very, very difficult for a new playwright, unless, unless you find a theatre that's actually looking for new playwrights, new voices. It's, mm. it's harder to get into the theatre, I think, than anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. That's, not, that's not where I would recommend a writer with dramatic talents to begin. I would, I would recommend that such a writer begin trying to get in into television. Hmm. Uh, I've, got, I've just got two questions left, Jeff, before we, uh, before we wrap up. Um, an interesting question that came in was about the length of films these days, because GoldenEye was 
two hours ten, most bombs about two hours. The latest film is just shy of, of three hours. Do you think film length is, uh, you know, an, an issue? There was a period when you could do three hour epics or three and a half hour epics. Lawrence mm. of Arabia wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't three hours and 40 minutes long. Yeah. But there was a period when it, the cinema owners wanted to get more showings in per day, mm. driven by money. Yeah. They managed to persuade everybody that a film shouldn't be much longer than two hours. Then it depends on the film. Mm. Michael Mann brings in heat at mm. two and a half hours. Heat is a thriller. You mm. thrillers shouldn't run two and a half hours on the screen. They're a two hour job. Yeah. Now, if the pendulum has swung a bit and we're getting longer films, then fine, as long as they're films that merit that length. When yeah. I did Exodus, Gods and Kings, with mm. a powerful director, he still couldn't get that thing look, film longer than just under two and a half hours, and it needed to be three and a half. Hmm. So he cut out so much stuff in order to get in his CGI battle scenes that hmm. the, the story didn't make sense, the character didn't develop. It wasn't as written, it was written as a three hour film, at least. And it ended up two and a half hours with the best yeah. stuff out. So, uh -huh. yeah, it depends on what sort of film it is. If you're doing Ben Hur, yeah, hmm. fine, it needs to be three hours or Spartacus. Hmm. Yeah. But if you're doing a thriller about bank robbers and a cop who's chasing them through two and a half hours is an indulgence. Scorsese indulged himself in in something. Which one was it? It was also two and a half and should have been far. Uh, it might be the departed, perhaps. Departed is quite mm -hmm. long. Uh, the departed. Oh, it was, maybe it was the departed, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I can't remember if they did a director's cut of Exodus Gods and Kings or not, but uh, um, uh, apart from the obviously not being happy with the final, you know, cut version, was Exodus Gods of Kings good in terms of working with Ridley Scott and, and the actual process of it? Well, Ridley and I had some very colourful sessions. Right. <laughs> so. We didn't agree on everything, but um, I was disappointed that it was cut about the way it was. Yeah. Um, not more, it's not much more I can say about that. Well, well hopefully they'll release a, a director's cut of it and, and they might go see it in, in its full glory one day because that would be nice for the. the I don't even, has he got a longer cut than two and a half? I, I, well, if you say there's stuff that's been cut out of the, the, the film because of the, um, the two it's hours. A, it's a question of what you cut. If you mm -hmm. cut um, uh, connective tissue mm. out of the film, you're destroying the film. Yeah. And when a director makes cuts, substantial cuts, he often takes connective tissue with it. And you pointed out, you can't take scene 83 out without affecting scene 12. Yeah. And he doesn't listen. Right. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, well, my final question to, to wrap the night up, Jeffrey. Um, is one, there... last, one last question. Oh yes, uh, is is um, there a, a, a project? Do you have a dream project? Something that you would a particular type of story or yes. novel that you yes. would? Yes, yes, there is. Yes, yes. Yeah. I want to write a western. A western, right? Yeah. Um, I almost, almost did. I had um. I had a deal with Columbia Pictures years ago, and the deal was that. They would introduce me to producers who had uh, a deal with them and were working out of a, off their lot. Mm. And I would go and see these producers and collect ideas. And this was a three year deal. I would present them at the end of the year with eight ideas for a film. Mm. And if they didn't like any of them, they'd give me eight ideas. And if I didn't like any of theirs, they would pick one of the 16 that they wanted to do. Sounded mm. great. Yeah, I ended up in um, partnership with the producer of The Full Monty. Not because I was writing anything like The Full Monty, but because we discovered that we both had a love of Westerns. So we concocted a Western idea between us and put it to Columbia. Mm. 
and Columbia turned it down because something similar, although different, had been proposed to them that year by two very, very clouty, powerful producers, and they had said no, and they couldn't in conscience say yes to us, having said no to them, because it would be a politically bad decision. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why I didn't make that Western, I didn't write that Western. Uh -huh. But I would love to write a Western, my mm -hmm. favourite genre. Uh, so, so we were talking about John Wayne, probably was a uh, big... Mm -hmm. I take you love the John Wayne films, the Westerns, and and what were what, what, John Wayne Westerns some of your favourites? Um, John Wayne's Westerns, The Searchers. The Searchers, yeah, that's my favourite. Yeah. Um, what, what, um, what, well, I very much hope, Jeffrey, that one day you get a chance to, to, to fill that dream. I think we'd all love to see. Uh, yeah, no, I've got a dream cast for my Western too. Hmm. Do you want to share one or two of them? Or? I, I, I love to see together in a Western. They are um, Denzel Washington, yeah, mm. Jimmy Smits, yeah, mm. um, uh, Timothy Oliphant, yeah, and Maus Mickelson. Oh yes, he's very good. Yeah, I could imagine a group of Western heroes played by those four guys. Yeah, and, and Matt is a lovely guy. I met him a few years ago, and he mm. has. Uh, Matt is a very, very, very nice guy. I met him a few years ago. The underrated actor. Have you seen him playing Hannibal Lecter in that TV series? Hannibal? Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. brilliant. Absolutely mm. brilliant. Yeah. Well, yeah, it sounds like a, a, a dream cast and a dream film. So, um, yeah. I'll, you know. I'd love to write it. Yeah, 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 it'd be great. To, well, uh, all the whole, among the 19 people who are listening to this, Let's hope there's one as a Hollywood producer who says, yes, let's have that Western. Well, if I win a big, a big lottery, win, I'll, I'll give you the money for it. But uh, unlikely, but I'll... <laughs> I yeah, well, it's, it's a hundred million dollar film, but never mind. Maybe you are millions, maybe then. But, probably uh, maybe, probably make it for 80 million dollars. Yeah. So um, thank, um, thank you for inviting me along to talk to your, your, your audience. Thank you, Jeffy. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeffy, for, for joining us. We'd all love to hear, hear all your, your comments and your wonderful stories, and I've loved every second of it. So, uh, it's always a pleasure to talk about the things you do. I think mm -hmm. we all find that. Yeah. And I hope I've asked um, some questions that you may not have been asked too many times before. So, uh, but um, okay. Okay. just uh, I... sorry. Thank you, Philip. Sorry, thank you much indeed, and uh, good luck, Jeffy. Right, bye. Bye.